Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the webinars that Comet delivers on a weekly basis. Um, today's title is Productivity and Safety in the Built Environment. We have got a, a very um, interesting interactive session with uh, industry experts Sue Butcher, Paul Wilkinson and Andrew Lambert. Um, we have a panel session that we will uh, run at the end. Um, but first, I want to just take you through what we'll be delivering today. Um, so our agenda is an intro from myself, a um, little bit about commit, a um, bit about the topic and a speaker introduction. Then I'll hand over to Sue. We'll talk about the human stories of change. Um, that will be followed by Paul. We'll talk about the impact of technology. And then Andrew, we'll talk a little bit about COVID wearables and how you get involved in the project that we've currently got running. Um, and then we've got a Q&A session. Um, what I would ask is um, if you've got any questions, don't leave them till the end, um, fire them through as we progress um, and we will read the questions out once we get to the 5.30 slot um, and we'll, we'll pick the top questions. So the sooner you can get those in the better. Um, we have got a little bit of um, an opportunity to overrun. We've, we call it the lock-in, and for those of you that are familiar with the uh, Comet Happy Hour, uh, we've been we've been doing this for some time now, and it's a little opportunity in a relaxed atmosphere to carry over and ask further questions. And uh, it has actually proved quite valuable in the uh, previous months. So please, yeah, fire your questions in. Um, I recommend um, that. What was I going to say now? Um, oh, the session's been recorded. I must tell you that. Okay. Um, so just moving on to the next slide. A little bit about Commit. Commit is a collaboration platform that brings owners, um, construction organizations, um, vendors, solution providers, research and development through academia together to develop solutions. And the Be Able, you see the logo in the top right, Be Able is a, is a, is a project formed from um, um, it was a, it was a funded project, um, government funded project that um, EMS the commit got together and formed this project, um, and it's the, as the result of um, well, in response to the COVID nineteen, uh, we call it a track and trace. Um, Andrew will talk a little bit more about that as we was uh, in his session, which is the third one. Um, but Commit has been around since 2003. As I say, it's a collaboration platform. It brings together various partners in industry to develop solutions and create enablement. Um, we have been running successfully um, the happy hours. Uh, we were doing this weekly. We're now doing it bi-weekly. Um, they are every Friday at 3.30. There's been some really interesting topics, subjects and, and discussion created. Um, it underpins what Commit is all about, and that is improving productivity. Um, I suggest you have a look at that. It's it's a great opportunity to get involved and improve productivity wherever you are, whatever you do. Um, the areas that we currently the areas that we currently look at go everything from project control to emerging systems and technology. Um, taking um, emerging systems and looking at the things like AI, AI um, blockchain. Got one chain minute to do it. So, okay. Um, at the end, we've got this lock-in to continue and ask more questions. So please do stick around for that if you can. Um, talking about the project, um, please check this out. I don't know if you can see the information in the bottom right corner, but please check that out. That is our project, Be Able. Um, now, if I can just Give a quick intro to the panelists. We've got Sue. Sue Butch is a director of communications um, for Just Practicing Limited. Sue trains an architect and managed three successful architects' practices during the 90s and the noughties, as she points out. She then set up a consultancy firm from home in 2011 and supports construction companies and associations to improve their online communications. Thanks very much, Sue, for joining. Sue's very active in the Comet um, world too. Thank you, Sue, for coming on today. Um, next up, we've got Paul. Um, just one second. That's time, Stuart. Paul Wilkinson has been working in the UK construction since 1987, started with 11 years in professional services, PR and marketing before moving on to construction technology PR. He was head of communications at construction software as a service startup for 10 years. Thanks very much for joining us today, Paul. Great to have you on the team. 
we've then got Andrew. Andrew is the um, founder and CEO of Electronic Media Services Limited, and he's also a partner in this project, Be Able. Andrew is a chartered engineer and an experienced broad level executive with a proven track record of developing new technology to solve business problems with extensive practical experience of work in Europe and Asia. Thanks for joining us on the team today, Andrew. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Sue and Sue will take us through the behavioural effects. Sue, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, so yes, as, as he says, I've been asked to talk about the behavioural effects on productivity. And whatever your current challenge is that you're facing at the moment, if it involves human beings, then technology is normally only a small part of the solution. The major part is going to be human behaviour, and that's why really we need to talk about that too. Um, could you go to the next slide, please, Stuart? Now, I began learning about remote technology, which we're going to be talking about today, when I still had an office job, but I had to work from home for uh, nearly a year in 2010 because I was unable to travel. And that taught me a lot. And then I set up my consultancy from my home a year later. And since then, I've learned how to adjust to a very different working life, uh, changing relationships and changing client needs, and including how clients have been coping with communication changes during this pandemic. I work with all sorts of people going through the crisis and their teams. And I've also talked to a lot of people in the last week who've been very kindly sharing with me how they've managed with their staff and with their bosses. So here are my tips on how you as an employer can help people deal with the behavioural aspects of the new normal, as we call it. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, the first thing to say is there is no such thing as normal. And... Uh, and that's because different people have different emotional responses to any crisis um, and different people uh, are in different situations and they have different characters. There really isn't a one size fits all. Uh, next slide, please. In construction, we're starting from a very poor standpoint, even before the effects of the lockdown. So uh, the CIOB Mental Health in the Built Environment Survey, which was published in May, found that 87% of respondents had experienced anxiety in the past year. So that's the year to May 2020. And then in June, Nuffield Health reported that around 80% of people in Britain working from home felt locked down and had a negative impact on their mental health. And a quarter of those said they were finding it difficult to cope with the emotional challenges of isolation. And in July, MIND surveyed 14,000 adults over 25 and found that isolation was playing a major part in their mental health deterioration. And a lot of that is about meeting people, friends, family, colleagues, not being able to get out and see people. And last month, uh, my local county council actually declared that they were expecting depression and anxiety to affect up to four in 10 of the population of Essex. Um, I don't know if that says anything about Essex, but there we are. Uh, next slide, please. It's important to remember that there is a reason for anxiety amongst construction workers, uh, not least because many sites have remained open or have reopened relatively quickly. And the Office for National Statistics has been reporting that low skilled construction workers in particular, amongst those most likely to die from COVID. And they argued that this is partly due to the nature of the work um, and, uh, and construction workers, low skilled ones, having a greater risk of exposure to the virus. Uh, as well. Next slide, please. So we need to understand what the challenge is. Next slide, please. Um, sure, thank sure. you. No problem. Um, OK, so let's think about the difference between stress and anxiety. Now, stress is a response to an external cause that subsides when the stressor is removed. And this is a graph from the CIOB survey too. Um, but anxiety is a mental illness of persistent excessive worries that don't go away when the stressor is removed. So some stress can be helpful, but not managing stressors can lead to anxiety. And if we understand what the stressors are, uh, we can remove them and then we can help reduce the risk of developing an anxiety disorder. OK, let's have a look at a few obvious stressors, really. Uh, next slide, please. The first uh, is social interaction. One of our biggest behavioural changes is that social interaction, as we know it, is no longer available to many people. And we've been cut off from our family, from our friends, from our colleagues. And much of our industry, of course, in particular, depends on socialising, be it, you know, handshakes, drinking, golf. Uh, we spend a lot of time actually glad handing people. 
Uh, next slide, please. Now, some of this loss uh, can be ameliorated with keeping up social communication. So if you can think of all the ways that people normally socialize at work, you can enable some of those to continue safely. And I've been told about various techniques to encourage social interaction and events that are work events that encourage social interaction. Um, for example, using video on one-to-one -one calls when you can, um, having your daily stand-up teams, but uh, keeping them, but keeping them socially distanced, and also things like encouraging people to relate to a group of peers as a buddy group and support each other in smaller groups. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second stressor is loss of routine. Now, many people ha uh, have found at the beginning of the pandemic that working from home was hard simply because they lost the routine things they would already done, um, like commuting, um, fixed work rotors, regular breaks with their friends at work at regular times um, and after work. And we need routine in order to get through the day. But uh, even though it's some more than others, we all need it. And routine is known as a key tool in helping us process the grief that we experience when we have loss. And uh, grief is what a lot of us are feeling right now. Next slide, please. So how can we rebuild routines? We need to find ways to recreate existing routines. Um, things like the daily stand-up calls can help, but also um, you need to find ways to allow people to make their own routines to rebuild those. Um, so you need to be flexible about when and how people work and make sure that they have the facilities that they need, whatever their individual circumstances are. And I'll come to that a little bit more in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, now, home life can be challenging. Now, whether you're working from home or not, um, home itself can really bring practical challenges for you as an individual. And many of us have suddenly been spending time with people that we really don't usually spend that much time with. And that's been rather difficult uh, for some of us. And uh, many of us have been coping for months with homeschooling, supporting vul vulnerable relatives, and of course, loss of income. All very private matters, but they're now impinging on our work, particularly as people are going back to work. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the key to managing home life related stressors is to be flexible and uh, so, because some people simply will not have the bandwidth and will need space or support to enable them to cope and others won't be able to afford to go on furlough, for example, or they may be particularly anxious about coming to work. And I spoke to the director, a demolition contractor yesterday, who um, a really great example, and he recognised that his site teams who are travelling to site in vans um, weren't able to do that safely so he needed the company to provide more vehicles and a lot of individuals are now traveling in company vehicles to site um, but also discover that some of the staff actually can't drive um, and for those arranged alternatives pairings more ppe and so on um, and another thing you ought to consider is that some people and this slide is an example can't always be at their desk in front of a camera they can't always have a video call. So do you actually have to have video on for everyone? That's how we need to be flexible. Uh, next slide, please. Now, looking at all of these uh, examples um, is that you really need to know uh, when people need space and flexibility in order to make it work. And the key to that is to learn how to practice active listening and that is listening for people's emotions now many of us especially if we're in a hurry we don't really listen for the point of view of the person we're listening to if we listen for emotions then we'll be able to discern the genuine need that's there we need to give people space to say those things but we also need to be able to hear them uh, next slide please and a really good example of this is that people need to feel safe. And Andrew was talking about this when we were planning this session. Different people have different definitions of what it means to them to feel safe. Um, and in a working environment, it has been shown that high performing teams need to have what's known as psychological safety. Uh, that's a belief that you won't be punished if you make a mistake. Um, and, uh, and there's a link there to an article about that. And of course, that's even more important now than it ever has been. So think about what would make people feel safer, not just what will make them be safer. Okay, next slide, please. 
And good listening will also identify who needs support to challenge behaviour that they're not comfortable with. So, for example, some people are more uh, sensitive to how close people are standing to them than others. And you may be able to support people to cope with travelling to work or make it possible for people to come to work at different times. Some companies are not requiring people with vulnerable family members to travel at all or helping them reduce the risk of travelling. Um, and uh, being able to challenge behaviour is um, requires a lot of support um, from other people in your team. Uh, next slide, please. So all these examples, we're really talking about something's known as compassionate leadership. And this means taking responsibility for the well-being of the people that you're looking after and getting ready and ahead of potential problems before they occur. So active listening, make sure people feel they're listening to, but also what might be a problem next in the context of that conversation. And then I, in order to cope, identify what you can control, what you can change and what you can't and focus on finding solutions to what you can control and change, not the problems. And it's very easy to get sucked into the problems. Um, this study from McKinsey, uh, published in March, had a very useful quote about this. It said, uh, what leaders need during a crisis is not a predefined response plan, but behaviours and mindsets that will prevent them from overreacting to yesterday's developments and help them to look ahead. And that's what we all need to look ahead all the time. And that's partly because the challenges are changing. Um, it used to be working from home and then it was furlough. Now it's venturing back to work. It's changes in our home life. It'd be redundancy. And then of course, concomitant with that, changing work staff ratio and additional time pressures on your staff. And there'll always be changes. And I wanted to share an example with you. Next slide, please. Now, five years ago, I was working with a workplace consultancy who were about to launch a workplace activity monitoring service, uh, ironically, uh, when a big story blew up in the press about Telegraph journalists walking out of work um, because their bosses were monitoring whether or not they were at their desks. And this was entirely a communication problem. In fact, now five years on, I think ironically, despite uh, the increase in anxiety that we've got, people will probably be much more willing to be monitored now than they ever were five years ago, because the situation has changed, the circumstances have changed, the uh, emotions have changed and the needs have changed. Uh, next slide, please. So that's it for me. I hope that's given you some food for thought and hopefully some questions to ask. So pop them in the box now and I'll speak to you later. Thanks very much, Sue. That's very, very interesting. Um, and I, I can see there's a few questions come in during that. Um, OK, I'm now going to hand over to Paul. Um, I think Paul, yours is the next slide up. There we are, Paul. Over to you. Can you hear me? You're muted. muted. Yeah, you're muted. Yeah, there you go. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Stuart. Um, in talking about productivity um, in the built environment, I think it, it, it's it's good to realise really that this isn't a new issue. We've been talking about the problem for as long as I've been in the industry. Uh, the Latham Report in 94, Egan in 98, Woolston Homes, Never Waste a Good Crisis. What a good title for, for the current situation. Hansford's Construction 2025 and Mark Farmer's Never um, um, Modernise or Die. All revisit recurring themes of waste, inefficiency, disputes, low productivity. Next slide, Stuart. One second. Mark Farmer um, showed this diagram in his report, and it, what it essentially shows is UK construction productivity has flatlined since 1994, year of the Latham report. Contrast that with manufacturing, where output is about 50% greater than in 1994. But when an entire industry, and construction is 7% of GDP, when an entire industry flatlines, it hampers the entire economy. Next slide. And if we look at the world economy, construction is potentially going to be a $15 trillion industry by 2030. But, uh, and we've seen huge adoption of IT across all industries, but construction is almost the outlier. It spends only about 1% of revenue 
on IT and advanced manufacturing spend ten, spends 10 times as much. Next slide. It's difficult to ignore the impacts of digitization on productivity. We've gradually digitized many of our daily activities, but construction processes and industry structures often remain very traditional and often quite paper-based. The McKinsey Global Institute's digitization index, you can see construction is right at the bottom, lagging all other industry sectors in terms of its digital competence. Next slide. Construction is digitizing, and we can see it's facing multiple digital disruptions. Uh, I won't talk about all of these. Mobile computing is transforming how, where, and what we communicate. We're creating data more quickly and in ever rising volumes. Social media is changing our expectations regarding real-time communication and sharing. Um, the cloud, you know, a third of cloud enterprise spend in, on IT will be in the cloud by 2022. And by 2025, some estimates suggest we will be interacting with the Internet of Things about once every 18 seconds. And so, and the BIM change is ongoing, of course. Next slide. Let's just drill into the, the impact of some of those things. In 1995, only four out of every 10,000 people in the world had Internet access. Roll forward 25 years, and we're now 53.6% of the world population has internet access. In the COVID world, pre-COVID world, we were online on our computers for about three and a half hours a day. I would guess now that that number is appreciably greater, and we're not necessarily always switching to mobile devices to do that. Next slide, Stuart. We've also seen a shift towards um, mobile working, um, where the uh, you know the number of devices, that, uh, where the competence of devices has Im improved uh, in, in immeasurably. I think in 1999 was the year of the first camera phone, the first GPS phone, the first phone with internet access. But it wasn't until 2007 that we first had the first touchscreen smartphone. So. Um, just 13 years ago, and the first tablet was in 2008. Next slide, Stuart. We've seen an explosion in tools to capture 2D and 3D images, and we're now sharing virtual and augmented realities on screen, in caves, and in headsets. Opportunities in some of those, for example, to do things like interactive safety training. Next slide. In the real world, we're already beginning to combine aerial imagery from drones, BIM data, and mobile captured information. EviFile, for example, is a digital progressive assurance tool that allows users to capture geolocated data uh, via their um, smartphones, their smart devices. That data can then be relayed back into the information model and used by the project team to help monitor progress and help improve the design, the work that they're involved with. Next slide. Norwegian, uh, a Scandinavian firm called Dalux is already combining BIM and augmented reality so that workers on site can compare as built with what was designed. Next slide, Stuart. And firms like React Tech are using wearable sensors with Bluetooth connectivity to monitor and protect workers against threats, including dust, noise, gas, hidden cables, and helping protect them against health risks such as hand-arm vibration syndrome. Next slide. And the mobile world also uh, allows us to take the data from BIM for use in facilities management, putting information literally at the fingertips of the people responsible for operations and maintenance of our built assets. Next slide, Stuart. And as a, an end user of the built environment, I, I, you know, on my travels to work, on my t uh, in my time in operational buildings, I have a wearable device that gives me instant feedback on the air pollution, the air quality, and the weather around me. Next slide. Put around the one direction. minute, please, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, the, the direction is undoubtedly digital. Next slide.
as an industry, we're used to sharing documents. We now need to be moving towards sharing data. Um, you know, the, the internet, a world based on international open standards, construction, a document-centric process where we often have to reformat information. Next slide. Successive government strategies have set about creating improvements, but it's not just about uh, productivity, it's about lowering costs, delivering projects more quickly, lower carbon emissions, and making UK more competitive. Next slide. Digital Built Britain is where we're heading. We're, we're combining construction with the information economy, smart cities, and business and professional services strategies. Next slide. And the targets that were, that were set by pharma are now being embedded in things in the industrial strategy. Government is investing through the budget in modernization. Whitehall is demanding better data to deliver economic, social and environmental good. And the construction sector deal is committing government to work together and modernize. Next slide. You're on time, Paul. OK, um, so we've got these three investments in major areas of technology under the industrial strategy, and we're being urged to focus on procuring for value. And last month we saw the launch of the value toolkit. Next slide. Final slide. And finally, the final driver of change is a response to the Grenfell disaster. Hackett highlighted opportunities for better use of data, mandatory use of data for record keeping covering the life of buildings and for digital records to be kept open and another development in July, the emergence of a, of a safety bill. In short, digital is going to be a key part of building a, safety, a safer future and a more productive one. End. That's me finished, Stuart. I think it's over to me. I'm I'm Andrew Lambert. Uh, good evening, everyone. Many thanks for for joining us this, for this this evening. Um, the uh, this I'm in, going to introduce Beerball, which was a project that was that is part funded by an Innovate UK grant. Innovate UK put out a call for uh, projects that could can counter the imp, in effects of COVID-19 on societal or business challenges. Um, and we, along with Commit, proposed a, uh, a project uh, titled Conquering, Conquering COVID in Construction, say, a Safe Managed Return to Site. Um, it, uh, and the project aligns with the uh, industrial strategy that Paul just mentioned. Um, the the I'd principle behind the product project is that there will be a, a management dashboard which will allow uh, uh, the manager, the, the site manager, to see the location of workers, heat maps of where activity is on site. Uh, they'd get notifications if there are too many people in uh, in in an area on a site, uh, occupancy of welfare units, um, and track workers who've either reported symptoms, who've had positive uh, tests, and and up and also help with the HSE riddle reporting. Next slide. Stuart, next slide. Oh, thank you. So, from a user point of view, it, it's a very simple uh, system to use. The, the user is uh, completes a, a daily self declaration. Um, at the moment, it's very simple. It's um, uh, have you had a test? Yes or no? Uh, and uh, how do you feel today? If you report that you feel fine, then uh, after the system checks whether you've been in any of any of your co-workers have reported any symptoms you just basically you will get a green tick on your mobile phone that says you're safe to go to work um, we focused around using uh, uh, wearable bluetooth devices um, there was when we proposed this project there was a lot of work going on by uh, nhs england to uh, use uh, personal electronic devices um, when uh, I thought their approach was never going to work, and, and when they trialled it on the uh, Isle of Wight, they actually detected less than 5% of iOS users um, with, the, with their tracing app. So I think so. Our, our uh, conclusion that personal devices, wearable devices, was the way to go. Um, the 
we've we've got some bracelets at the moment. They will uh, if I press the button here, they flash red when you when you've been been too close together. Those uh, events are recorded, and then they can get uh, and then they can get re uh, sent back to the to the cloud for analysis. Next slide, please. Stuart, next slide. So, oh, have we jumped? We've jumped a slide, I think, Stuart. No, maybe we haven't. Um, so there, there is a um, uh, the 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 essence of the system is that um, around the site, that so the users will wear, wear their, their their bracelets around the site. We place some uh, little. Uh, Bluetooth stations. These talk to a gateway using LoRaWAN, and that will send uh, data back to the cloud. Um, the system has uh, the ability to generate heat maps. Um, so these these can be used to identify um, areas on the site that might need cleaning from a, from a, uh, uh, keeping the site sanitized because it's where that you've got high volumes of people. It could help you. Uh, replan the work so that perhaps you could spread uh, particular workers out um, and and it could help improve productivity because you know where your workers are on, on pace perhaps if you put the Bluetooth devices on some on the equipment you'd know where your equipment is as well um, the sort of reports that you can get out of the system are the top uh, that the top that the users who have the most contacts uh, events recorded on their, their devices you could also filter that by the sort of top department so you would know whether it's the electricians the plumbers or the plasterers who are generating the most number of contacts and you could look at their work patterns and see how you could improve the social distancing you can also track the the top location so on the on the screen here you can see the red hot spots where there's a lot of people active in in those areas um, and obviously of course from the track and trace point of view you could uh, uh, you can get a report of those people who've reported positive tests and any other site visitors who've been in contact with uh, uh, with those uh, with those users uh, next slide please Stuart, uh, there we go. So um, where, where we are in the project, we, we've had a, a very rapid, uh, we've had a very rapid development process. We've uh, we've uh, we've got some blue, we've got the Bluetooth devices uh, on on the wrists working. We have um, we have uh, these uh, uh, Bluetooth stations that report back over over LoRaWAN. We have the web app for reporting the daily symptoms. And, and the call to our call to action really for tonight is we're looking for uh, partners who will join the project and help with some trials. So you want uh, sites the where they could uh, the users would um, uh, do the daily reporting, wear the bracelets, and the, have the data reported back, so we can test the robustness of the. The bracelets, of course, they work fine in my office, but we don't know what they're like on a on on a on a construction site. Maybe we need a slightly more robust device, um, and and also to understand what uh, reports are are useful out of the management uh, portal. Um, so with that, that's the end of my my presentation. Stuart, back to you. Gone very quiet, Stuart. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, thanks very much, Andrew. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Sue. Um, so we're now in. We're now into questions, and um, let me bring everybody's everybody's webcam back up. Can you turn them back on? Yeah, we we're everybody? all on. We're all on. We're all on. We're all on. Mike's all, are all on. I think Paul needs to unmute himself. Yes. Okay. Okay, we've got uh, we've got a few questions. Um, let me just head down the route of the first question. So, this question is: What are the key challenges that construction, in fact, the construction project teams are facing relating to um, productivity during this pandemic? Um, Paul, I know you touched on a little bit. Let me. <laughs> can you hear me? No, Paul. Paul can't. No. Just a second. Is let me see if. His microphone's muted. 
You need to unmute yourself, Paul. You can't. You say you can't. Um, has somebody else muted him? There you go. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> what happened? What happened? I think the power, the, sky, the, power, the power in the sky muted me. Can you technology. repeat the question again, Stuart? Technology challenge. <laughs> um, okay, so what are the key challenges construction project teams are facing related to the product, related to productivity due to the pandemic at this time? Well, I'd say the the main ones. Um, firstly, uh, it's a, it's about managing the the social distancing on construction sites is often a major challenge. Um, you know. In many cases, we've had to adapt workplace processes where people have often worked very closely with one another, and you know some processes have required uh, workers to work um, and, and collaborate you know, within touching distance. Now, in some cases, we've had to work out new new ways of delivering those kinds of work, but also pe how people route around sites. You know, some of our sites have had to be reconfigured for one-way working. Um, for safe delivery of materials, tools, and equipment to various areas on the site, and you know, all the, all the processes of tracking people in and out of site and, and their movements around site also take up time. Um, and so, you know, these are areas, these are issues which are affecting the productivity, certainly at a site level. And, and back in the offices, of course, you know, we we're used to collaborating face to face. Um, and that is, uh, in, in some cases, you know, the face-to-face -face meeting, meetings are can be incredibly productive, not necessarily as productive when we're having to deal with online meeting places. And sometimes the limitations, as we've seen this afternoon, of technology getting in the way of effective uh, communicating, uh, inadvertent muting and other things. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I join in there? Um, yes, carry on, Sue. Yeah. I completely agree about the online meetings. Lots of people don't like them. And of course, there is the whole sort of Zoom fatigue um, concept where if you actually have to look at people all the time, that can be very exhausting. But in terms of on-site, the question about on-site, I think um, a lot of uncertainty about what was and was not safe was a big problem quite early on. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a there, this is all a question of statistics, really. And I think uh, the need to go back to site where uh, where uh, contractors were doing uh, say, um, critical projects like uh, refurbishment of ho hospitals, of course the Nightingale projects, but also schools that are in use. Um, you know where you've got leaks and you've got major issues with health and safety. You can't just stop maintaining buildings. So there was all of that. That's accepted. But then, what is a safe way to work? And there was some. At the time, I remember there was there was quite a lot of uncertainty about you know distancing and PPE. What PP? There's discussions about PP still going on, aren't they? Really, um, and out of that arose, I think um, uh, there was a big shut the sites campaign um, on Twitter, um, which didn't get very much um, visibility in the media, of course. But there was there were quite a lot of people talking to each other and organising and trying to get things to change because they felt it was unsafe. Now, if they, if it, it might have been safe. Uh, to work or relatively safe or safe in the circumstances but obviously there was a communication issue there if people don't feel that they're being looked after that can be a problem I think things have changed a bit now but that was what was happening you know March April time that was a big problem sure It'd be interesting yeah. to hear what other people have experienced yes, more recently there's a few more comments uh, coming in thanks for that Sue um, so I've got a I've got a, a comment or a statement that's come from Colin um, Colin Everson, thanks Colin for this. Um, Colin's, asked, Colin's making a statement, has productivity reduced? We have certainly reduced our business costs with, mi with a minimal change in outputs. Any, any thoughts on that, Paul? I think it depends on how you measure productivity. I mean, um, as, a, as a market sector, we're, we're, we're probably still at a very early stage in, in working out how, we, how we'd measure that productivity effectively. Often it's simply a question of looking at the value created against the hours and resources it takes. As a, as a sector, we are incredibly inefficient. It's one of the reasons that we've had Latham Report, Egan Report, um, Wilson Home, and so forth, is that you know people like Latham were suggesting that we could easily take 30% waste 
out of the uh, industry's functioning, um, working with still existing uh, technologies and so on. Digitization offers a big opportunity, opportunity for us to move forward. Um, and I think what we've seen in um, the COVID situations in some cases, um, people have found that things like digital working have actually made, meant some processes are more are quicker. We are using the resources we have at our fingertips much more um, efficiently because we don't have the interruptions of people coming along and tapping us on the shoulder. I spoke to somebody who said, you know, um, <coughs> The fact that somebody in the office was regarded as the, the fount of all knowledge meant that he was constantly being interrupted by people in his office. The minute yeah. he started working remotely is that people couldn't tap him on the shoulder. And he, he was then able to respond in a timely way um, to the incoming calls um, without, the inter without the unstructured interruptions that were taking place. So there can be yeah. some real positive advantages out of this uh, uh, way of working now. I, I tend to I tend to agree, Paul. Um, I, I'm I've certainly seen it probably to improve, but I do know of other others that, that it's actually gone down. Um, and I think there's but, a price to pay yeah, as well, yeah, isn't yeah. there? Yes. Um, because essentially, if you're talking about productivity, you're talking about two factors: output and cost. Can you get more output for less cost? And of course, how you calculate output and cost uh, relative. So if our business costs are reduced, therefore we're more productive. Well, that doesn't necessarily work because it depends what the actual costs are. So your business costs in terms of financial, you know, um, say, for example, I employ a PA, my turnover the, the year I employ a PA goes up 40 percent and she costs less than me. So that's productivity. Right. That's fine. That's very simple and depends what sort of work you're doing. Um, but and and some things have made us more productive. So commuting is unproductive time. Largely people do use it productively. And you, often people have said that. But actually sitting on a train with loads of stiffs is not really a productive thing to be doing um, financially um, and time-wise, you know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, you save money not commuting as well as time and a lot of individuals have saved money. So that will be a motivator for not actually going into work if they can work from home. But yeah, yeah. another example is uh, a lot of companies have furloughed a lot of staff and then kept some staff on and expected their workload to increase to take in the workload of the other people are furloughed or just some of them. And, this, and as things go, and we've seen this with previous recessions, as people have to be made redundant because there are no funds available to pay them and the cash isn't coming through the business fast enough, the downside is the people that remain get more and more put upon trying to do more and more of the remaining work and trying to keep your staff workload balance going is actually very difficult. Um, and of course, that can cause all sorts of emotional and mental health problems for those stress problems and then anxiety for those people who are still working for you. And they are in much more demand. So it's really important to look not just at the financial costs, but also at the other costs of becoming more productive in that sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and thanks for that, Sue. And I'll just pick up on what, um, thanks, Lorraine. You made a comment here. Um, she's more productive. She's working at home. There's no more two hours each way on the M25. Um, and, you know, it, it, she's achieving quite a lot by the sounds of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's pluses and minuses. Um, we have got a lot of questions. Keep them coming. Some of these are great. Um, thanks, Warren. Warren Hill, how would you convince, this is for Andrew, how would you convince someone to wear a device that is tracking them when a lot of people are very suspicious of tracking their individual movements, not only at site, but off site too? Andrew? So I think one of the issues that one of the ways we would answer that is really that that these devices really would only track you at the uh, at at site. I mean, it wouldn't it wouldn't know where you are off site because there will be no device, there will be no gateways or anything like that to know where you are. Um, you can always take the bracelet off and put it in your car, uh, which is what I normally do when I leave the office, uh, and it sits in my car. And if if there's no movement on it, the bracelet actually goes to sleep. Uh, just to save the battery life. Um, I think this is tracking people on site. I think this is really just explaining um, to, to the users that this this the solution is that the system is really there to help with their benefit. So um, 
if if there is uh, if there is somebody who's reported uh, that they were sick on site it, you would actually know who uh, who exactly who they've been in contact with and you could in, help those people isolate or or manage uh, uh, or, or manage their their work in the in in the, manage them on, on the work site so um in the in the tennis world at the moment i know this because my wife is a tennis fanatic they've had one of the players who's tested positive and they've in, and they've actually created another a, a bubble within a bubble so wow. all the tennis players are in a bubble they've now created a bubble within that where the people who've been in contact with this uh, person who has tested positive are, are also isolating they can play their matches but they have to stay away from the other players and yeah. and this would you know our solution would, would help manage that in in that work environment so sure. why not you know it would it would remove that need to say well actually we've got 20 people who've reported six so we actually have to close the whole site down yeah 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 um we're just about on the 545 which is what we'd uh, advertised um, we have got the the, the lock-in option if um, if you want to stay for a bit longer. There are quite a few more questions coming in. Some of these are, are extremely good questions. There's a few statements. There's a few observations. Um, I'm just going to go back now to Colin. Colin Everson. Thanks, Colin. Um, you you make a statement here. Um, you'd argue that face face-to-face -to -face meetings are often lacking clear actions and decisions. I'd agree with that. Um, but it depends who's managing the meeting. For me. Um, but yeah, you can get away without any actions or decisions. Um, can the correct use of online tools be used to improve this? I think yes, but let me ask the panel. Who wants to take that? Sue? Um, yes, it's interesting, isn't it? I think uh, it's much easier if you're doing an online meeting, for example, for people to um, uh, disappear. Um, sure, sure. Particularly that if there are a lot of people in the meeting, um, they're actually uh, muting their microphone, eating their breakfast, playing or whatever. You can't see what they're doing um, and therefore it's beholden on the, whoever's facilitating the meeting to actually run it like a very tight ship, particularly because it is so exhausting to be in meetings. And I do work with some people who literally spend eight hours a day in meetings and that's not very productive. So the way, the way to do that is to do things like um, have a fixed agenda. Um, publish it in advance, say for every item who's responsible for it and what the action is going to be and that um, there will be an action before you move on to the next item, even if it's that so-and-so is going to come back by a certain time. So you can, you know, if, if you, you need someone who knows how to facilitate meetings um, and if you can't do it yourself, and this is very common, you know, you like to be in charge. If you can't actually make people make decisions, then get someone who can. It doesn't matter who it is. Um, we're all professionals professionals here and uh, it's a different skill to other skills that you may have so it's important to you know be aware of that yeah thank thank you Sue I, I agree um Colin I know you've got another question there and I'm going to come back to that in a moment um a question for Paul this comes in from Alistair Rigdon thank you Alistair um regarding Hi, Alistair. <laughs> sorry regarding recognize the name what are the default most common present processes for clean cleaning all the high touch points with many coming in and out of the buildings any products beyond spraying fogging etc paul wow uh, it's a tough one for me i'm not uh, you know in terms of disinfection and, and things like that um i think i, th I was going to say i think one, one of the things that um COVID has taught us is in some cases we need to change almost the way in which we interact with the building and touch it as, li as little as possible. You know, um, I was very conscious in the early days of going into shops, you do not lean on counters. Um, um, everything with your elbow. Yeah, everything with elbow, you know, it's, it's, it's not shaking hands with people. Well, I was watching the, um, the early videos that the Construction Industry Council and others collaborated upon in terms of safe working practices. It was about people bringing their own pens. So when they signed in, they weren't using a shared pen that other people had touched. Um, it was about having uh, you know, the hand sanitization points everywhere, people bringing their own sandwiches. Um, and so on. So again, they didn't have to sit down in, in shared um, uh, canteen spaces. 
and I think we're still facing some of those challenges even even now. Um, yeah. I think there are challenges also when it comes to handling uh, the building products, because in, inevitably in some of the uh, installation processes, there will be uh, operatives who need to touch, um, albeit with gloves, usually the, the same things, but there will be issues where they have to come in close prox proximity with each other and it's difficult yeah. to screen. This is yeah. where we have some regulations in about uh, use of face coverings, where workers are having to work in close proximity for um, you know more than a few minutes at a time. Sure, sure. Anybody else want to? One of the benefits of being able to track where people have been on site is you do actually know where to focus though, that cleaning activity. I um, mean, this has come up of some of the studies of office uh, office locations where they've they actually now only clean those places where people have been they don't they don't go around doing the antibacterial stuff in meeting rooms that have not been used which which would have been the norm in in the past yeah yep. yeah sure and, and there are i just tweeted i'm tweeting on the uh, hashtag be able webinar by the way and um i remembered an article in design back in april about door handles um so i've sent it on the hashtag and to paul um it's an article about different designs for hand uh, for door handles where you don't have to use your hands to open the door um, and there are ways of adapting existing door handles and i'm sure that on construction sites that a lot of people are thinking about those things too. Um, how can you uh, stop people touching high touch places in the first place? Um, yeah. And then you don't have to use so many chemicals yeah. and, uh, and you know, you stop the problem happening to a certain extent. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Sue. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Alistair, I hope that answers your question. Um, I've got one that as more of a statement, oh, well, no, it is a question, actually. Let me just read this again. This is from Robert Barker. Thank you, Robert. Have you seen the Loughborough report? And I think Robert goes on again, just a little bit further down. It is assessed that although there was staff reduction, productivity was, sorry, staff reduction, productivity was higher. Okay, thank you for that. Um, right, we've now, we've got a statement um, from, let me just read the rest of this out. Thank you, Nick. Nick Nesbitt. Um, if 30% is waste and 10 to 15% is devoted to health and safety precautions, it doesn't leave much for real output. Um, I know what you're saying. Um, there are ways and means of reducing the amount of time that you put into health and safety. Of course, we can't uh, displace health and safety. It's number one, wherever you go, whatever you do, you must have it at the front of the queue. Uh, everybody must be bought into it. There are uh, ways and means. Just a few weeks back, we presented on something that projects are now taking up, which is um, the use of VR to deliver safety inductions, presentations, briefings. Check that out, because that is really, really good stuff. Very powerful and can save a lot of time and effort. Um, so thanks for the question on that. Anybody else want to add to that? I was going to add to it quickly, because I think the... Um... <sighs> One of the shifts that we started to see is, is this movement towards design for manufacture and assembly and off-site. Um, that has huge potential to reduce the number of operatives um, required on-site to manage conventional sort of wet type processes um, by having most of the uh, fabrication done in a factory type environment. Um, that factory type environment is often implicitly a lot safer than a site-based um, location. There's less right. working at height, people have more materials and they have the correct equi equipment at their fingertips. So you can shift the health and safety issues um, and, and reduce them to some extent by adopting different ways of working, including off-sites, um, and doing this kind of just-in-time delivery, um, where in some cases the you know, the, the, the thought and planning that goes into the assembly processes means that there are only, there's the limited, uh, you know, the, there's only one way in which the uh, elements of a structure, for example, or a facade can be fitted together. And, you know, it, it's a sort of, uh, you know, it, it, it means that there's, there's less scope for uh, error creeping into those processes. Um, yeah, so it, it, I think I think I by agree. some clever, clever design and thinking through the construction sequencing processes, we can help eliminate some of the safety issues and not reduce them all, not not reduce, not completely eradicate them, but certainly reduce them. 
yeah, the offsite creates um, it creates more routine, which you don't have on a on a on a, on a project site where it's an ever changing environment. So yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent agree. Um, okay, so the next question I've got here, and and Colin, I don't know whether you're still on actually, but um, does the panel think the situation? What will it be like in twelve months? Will it be back to normal? Uh, increased well-being issues or new ways of working adopted on a permanent basis? Who wants to take that one? Sue. I don't. I don't think we'll be back to normal in twelve months. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is how long. Um, how long before we get a vaccine? And uh, and I think you know the, uh, I've been talking to uh, trade show um, people recently because I did a piece about trade show. Will you go back to trade shows? A lot of them are continuing in the autumn and have been put off from the spring and summer um, and others are happening in the spring next year will they actually happen well it's uh the question is that's a very much a, again a behavioral issue that people won't come back to what they were doing they won't be able to do that uh, there won't be enough confidence to do that um, and of course we're heading into the winter second wave um that will be coming up so um when we come through to the spring so that will be in six months time um we'll probably just be recovering from a very bad winter um and i think that will have affected politically what will be allowed and then the question is the bio, the the vaccine um will that help us will there be a vaccine by the spring um and uh, so i think in 12 months it's unlikely that we'll be back to so-called normal um, and I'm suspicious that, that there will ever be an actual normal again in the sense that we won't go back to where we were we'll go to somewhere else it'll be it'll improve because we will have learned to cope um, and in terms of you know uh, we've also got the recession to face up to um, and how that will affect the industry and who in the industry will adapt in order to cope to get through that recession um, so there are lots of variables there um, but I think it's unlikely sure sure um Okay, I've got a question about uh, data protection. And uh, Karsten, thanks for sending this one. Um, data protection law requires evidence of a, of a DPIA, data protection impact assessment, when there's a high risk to the rights and freedoms of people. Um, best done at a time of project conception and before going live. Are DPIAs available for the solutions shown here today? Andrew? I mean, we, we've certainly worked hard to make sure that it's very difficult to get any personal identifiable information at if if you're not a if you're not an authorised user in the system. Um, so so the, the 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 approach that we have really is sort of security by design, which is a thing that's pushed by uh, by the government. So to make sure that your um, uh, uh, the, the 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 system you're designing is secure in the first place, so it's about how you control access to that information. Um, and and I think what we'd like to do during the trial, if that happens, is understand what what particular organisations want to do in terms of proving their um, in, in in completing their their data protection policies. I think the uh, we would adopt the same we would adopt the same process that anybody like Microsoft or these other providers do is we have a sort of set of principles and an open and clear transparent uh, description of how any data is you any data is captured and how it's used sure yeah okay thank you for that um Lorraine makes a comment here have you seen the construction charity lighthouse are offering free mental health courses at present I think Sue, you're nodding. Are you nodding? Uh, yes, yes, they are, and there are quite a lot of organisations in the in the mental health space at the moment. The Lighthouse is a very good example of one, um, and they have a connection uh, with uh, now. Can I remember what they're called? Mates in Mind, um, and uh, as well, and uh, um, and there are a number. There are also a number of initiatives that. Um, individual contractors are doing um, and promoting um, and working with their subcontractors on as well. Um, but absolutely, Lighthouse is a very good example of um, information. I'll go and have a look and see if I can find a link to that and I can share it on sure, Twitter. Yeah, thank, thank you, Sue. Um, 
Okay, a few more questions. Keep them coming in. Um, we have. Uh, thanks, Nick. You've um, you've qualified um, what I was thinking. Um, Nick comes back to his question about safety. Um, oh, sorry, 30% waste, 10 to 15 is devoted to health and safety. Um, what Nick said is, I was voicing the popular perception, not my own. I thought that, Nick, actually. I did think, yeah. Thanks for uh, qualifying. Um, so Warren comes in, UVC can be used as long as there are no people in the building. Thanks, Warren. Um, Alistair comes in again. Great point, Andrew. Read the heat maps. My question was loaded in that my company's product is a temporary antimicrobial mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, yeah. cover that would suit these areas. Habits are hard to change, so not so easy to get people to change. Any, any, uh, you want to come back on that, Andrew? Um, yeah, people's habits uh, and behaviors are very odd. I, I went into a pub the other day and the chap handed me the pen to to fill the contact tracing thing in um where uh, i mean it where, whereas i just refused i i didn't want to touch his pen because i didn't know where it was where it had been um uh, uh you know sue has talked to sue talked a lot about the behavioral issues and and some of the things you have to to do to support workers and encourage uh encourage that that behavioral change sure um Lorraine has shared the um, the uh, website for the Lighthouse Club, but I think it's dot lighthouseclub.org. I can't see the rest of it. Oh, mental dash health dash first dash aid dash training forward slash. I'll try and put that in the end box actually in the um, in the comments. Unless you've already done it, Sue. Um, I've just tweeted it under the okay. Be Able webinar uh, right. hashtag. Okay. Right. Um, Okay, one question. Right, okay. So I think, Sue, this might have been in response to you, or it might have been Paul's actually, I can't remember. But, um, okay. Further to the explanation, would you please elaborate in what areas BIM can assist in the pandemic right now and how? Who wants to take that, Sue, Paul? I think that's a Paul question. I think it is probably a, a one for me. Um, Have I read that right? Yeah, over to you, Paul. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it it's touching on a range of digit. You know, BIM is just part of a range of digital process changes that we're in the we're in the midst of making now. Um, BIM enables us, for example, uh, if we think about uh, it more than just being a three D um, technology, we can start to think of it as a process supporting a range of activities which take place over time. Um, so we can start to look at, for example, sequencing of activities so that we can design buildings where the construction and installation of components into the structures um, requires fewer people. But I think at the, at the very outset, um, in, in the new sort of post new, new post-COVID world, if there ever is a post-COVID world, we might exist in a perpetual COVID world. But we might then need to be designing using BIM um, to create spaces where people can effectively socially distance and where we're able to track people movements through those spaces and maybe use the kinds of heat map technologies that Andrew's been talking about so that we can monitor how well uh, people pro pro process through pinch points, um, you know, typical things in London underground stations will be escalators and um, the ticket gate areas, for example. Um, BIM as a, as a process enables us to bring in technologies which allow us to track the movement of individuals using both modelling and CCTV type, type camera data and um, optimise the designs of those spaces so that people can safely socially distance. Um, in that kind of environment, so you know, I think I think there's a number of ways in, w in which it can be can be can be deployed to help create a safer and healthier uh, way ways of working, ways of travelling, um, <clears throat> ways of interacting with the building and with the other people in that building. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, okay, Alistair comes back in. Um, yes, you can get a final mention, Alistair. No problem. Um, product placement, Stereostick.co.uk. 
Um, there you go, I've mentioned it. Um, keep, keep the questions coming in. I think just for a second or two, what I'd like to do if I can, is just go through the rest of the slides because we're now 20 minutes um, into the lock-in. So if you don't mind, I'll just do, I'll just do the other slides. Um, so we're into the Q&A, um, bear with me. I want to just mention again, we are looking for trial partners for the uh, Be Able uh, project. So just follow what, we, what we're saying on the screen there. There is a link, just one second. Um, so it's beable.tech forward slash, if you can have a look at that, or it's actually on the commit website as well. Um, so, okay, I want to say thank you to Sue, Paul, and Andrew, uh, and also today's attendees, and for all the lovely questions. Um, Next slide, please. Where is it now? It's gone. It's jumped two ahead. Oh, goodness me. Oh, now, oh. It's, now it's jumped out altogether. Goodness me. Just a second. You love technology when it works great. Sorry. I didn't That's do anything. The one. Honestly. That's the button. That's the button. I didn't That's do anything, honestly. And it's doing oh. it again. What is it doing? It's a keyboard issue, I think. If somebody, have you put your, have you got something resting on your keyboard? Not at all. All right, okay. Not at all. So just let me go back. Right. So the next session we've got is on the 11th of September. It's the happy hour uh, and it's change detection and impact assessment in construction. And that's going to be delivered by Enable, one of the commit members. Um, I'd like to say thanks very much for the sponsors, O2 Business and Rebim. Um, without their support, we couldn't deliver the uh, webinars that we've been doing. Um, the session today is recorded. It will be posted. Um, please follow us through social media. Um, and there we are, back to our lock-in slide. Um, so just let me have a quick look. I think there's a couple more questions. Just one second. OK. Um, right. Actually, there's no more questions. It's showing there is, but... Um, Okay, so final thoughts then, if I can go around the room. Andrew, would you like to pitch in? Anything else to add to what we've already said? Um, no, I think I would. I would. I would certainly agree with uh, Sue. I don't think. Uh, I don't think COVID nineteen is going to go any, away anytime soon. Um, the, uh, the the Russians uh, are already on their second uh, vaccine, which has less um, side effects than the first. Uh, and I and I think this is one of the challenges. If 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 a vaccine is rushed through and in and, and pushed out, will people actually want to take it? Um, and um, I, I also agree. I don't think work will ever go back to exactly the way it was. We we will we will get back to something that looked similar, but it will be different. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm hearing quite a lot of that. Um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for their fascinating questions and um, and for their input. I'm sure there are lots of things that people have got to say that they haven't had a chance to on this topic. So feel free to come on Twitter um, and use the hashtag BeAbleWebinar um, and uh, and talk to us. Uh, you'll find everyone's handles there as well, so they, uh, they can all join in. Um, Brilliant. Thanks, Sue. Paul, over to you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to go back to almost the question about, you know, the, the suspicion that people might have about wearing devices where, where people track, uh, can be tracked. You know, contrast that with the voluntary wearing of Fitbits and fitness watches and things like that. Many people do that for reasons uh, of, you know, joining in with other people in the community uh, of, you know, fitness trackers and runners. You know, I, I'm, I'm a runner, you know, to share my running routes with other people. Um, the reason it, there is this suspicion, unfortunately, I think is, is partly down to um, historic reasons of, of labour relations within the industry. And then, you know, we've had, unfortunately, um, instances where workers have been blacklisted in the past for raising health and safety concerns. And, and you know, I think we're, to some extent, we're reaping the, uh, the sad rewards of a culture where um, employers did abuse 
um, their workers in that way, um, preventing them, um, raising those concerns, seeing them as troublemakers. Yeah, it would be great if in the post-COVID world, or even if it's not post-COVID, we had that same kind of neighbourliness that we saw in the very early days of the pandemic and that kind of community sharing and looking out for one another penetrated into the work into the workplace and into our construction site teams and so on with people looking out for each other and recognizing they had a mutual obligation to look after each other's health and well-being you know i could see that as a very positive outcome of this process but it demands um you know quite a major overhaul of of how we manage social relationships in the industry um, and it's not one that's fostered by adversary relationships, low margins, um, contractual approaches and disputes. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Paul. Um, I, I speak from experience on this and, and um, this is on a positive note. There was a few issues. We, we had to set up a um, um, health screening um, operation and it was initially met with scepticism. Uh, in fact, there was so much scepticism, it was ne nearly shelved. But it was only through the client's insistence that, that we, we went ahead. And um, the, what, it, what it sort of highlighted, um, there was a few negatives, but the, there was more positives. Um, one or two individuals had some underlying health conditions which they didn't know about. Now, it was all, it was all kept, um, it was very secure. It was only shared between the patient and the um, um, the, the, the lead um, oper operative in the, in the business, if you like, that was in charge of it, and the health screening organisation, and it, it actually saved a few individuals from from anything any further harm. Um, it put them in in the picture. They had no idea of of, of what was you know what they had, um, and they were very grateful afterwards. And and that to me is a real positive to come out of stuff like that. Um, so, you know, if you can help uh, as, as an employer, it's a positive step in the right direction to look after the people that you've got in your employ. So, you know, that, that was my, my little story. But uh, as I say, it was met with tremendous scepticism to start with, uh, to the point where people were resisting anything. And um, only through a little bit of gentle persuasion and honesty, you know, transparency, that it, um, it, it proved beneficial. So, um, so any 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 more parting shots? Anything anybody's thought of? If not, we're we're pretty much at um, the extra half hour, so we should we should close up and um, say thank you very much to everybody. Um, we will make the recording available in a day or so. Uh, be on the Commit website. We'll also we put a link on the Be Able website as well. Um, but thanks very much, everybody, and um, we'll see thanks, you on the Sue. next webinar. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Thanks, yep. Vanessa. Um, yep. Lawrence on the call as well. Thanks, thanks, Lawrence. Um, so yeah, see you all soon. Thank, Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Have Thanks. a good evening. Bye. Bye. Bye.